Jihadi Jones and the Kalashnikov babes. <clears throat> you feel your mongering little Americans die. I spit on you and your mother, you puke-eating pig die? You think I care if your family die? I only care if they die. Have you read this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now you haven't, so don't jump to conclusions. <laughs> what part did I miss? The part where he uh, turns into a hero? Maybe. This character, uh, Muhammad, the guy who said, um, Abdul, pass me the pliers, they hold down the grandmother by her throat, turns into a hero? Maybe? <laughs> and, and what, 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 playing this bug-eyed, psycho, sadist, terrorist, whoa, 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 is the T word ever used in the script? Click. With movies like Crazy Rich Asian and Black Panther breaking all sorts of sales records, there is hope that 2018 might be a breaking point for Hollywood and its representation. And so it leads me to believe if it's time that we start representing Muslims as more than just Allahu Akbar screaming terrorists on screen. Whenever I travel, I carry a small box of Altoid mints with me. Because after a 4 hour 7 a.m. flight, everyone has bad breath. And so anyone is willing to take a mint from the Muslim on the airplane. And I know that I have been successful when my neighbor turns to me and says, Hey, so what's your name? My name is Amal. It means hope. There is no shortage of Muslims on television. Unfortunately, they're either the terrorists on homeland or any general threat to national security. Growing up in a post 9-11 era, I never once saw a functioning family like mine on the Disney Channel. And unfortunately, neither did the three and a half million other Muslims currently living in America. This is only compounded in the way that they see us. According to a study done by the poll research community, 30% of Americans think that we should bomb Agrava, the fictional city in Aladdin. <laughs> so, with drama from Jihadi Jones and the Kalashnikov Babes by Yusuf Gandhi, prose from Muslim stereotypes by Fish Assad, poetry from The Muslim on the Airplane by Mal Qasir, and articles from Affinity and Vice. Program titled, Changing the Channel. So that I can finally see someone who looks and talks like me. Is the character represented as superstitious, culturally backward, or anti modern? Are there reasons a threat to the Western way of life? So, whenever people like me start to show up around these uh, activities, at some point we start to feel um, guilty. Like a couple months ago, there was this a white guy who tried to fly a plane in an IRS building, and I know all my Middle Eastern and Muslim friends are watching the TV going, please don't be Hassan, don't be Hussein, don't be Hassan, and the name came out as, <gasps> Jack! Woo! That's not one of us! But I kept watching for the news reporter to come back and be like, before committing the crime, Jack converted to Islam. <laughs> Jack! <laughs> Why? At the airport, my name is Random Search. And on the streets, it's terrorist, raghead, oppressed. My name is, could your Muslim neighbor be an extremist jihadi? Radical? Suspect? And when you don't ask for people's names, you are not asking for their stories. And so we reach a point until anyone with a hijab on is a raghead who needs liberating, anyone with white skin is a racist cracker, and anyone who looks like my father blows up planes. Click, and when they are represented, Aladdin. While a bit of a heartbreaker to put in the uh, fail category, for all the nostalgia it holds for young viewers who saw their own brown skin for the first time in Disney animation form, the Disney animation made that very skin and in extension our culture <gasps> a punchline. It's a representation of Jasmine, 
as a woman of no agency stuck in a misogynistic world of people making decisions for her is particularly jarring. <gasps> and let us not forget the immortal lines in the opening theme song. It's barbaric. But hey, that home is the character representatives of victim or perpetrator of Islamic terrorism. Our therapist is just rationally angry. Why did you even show me this piece? Because you haven't held one in two years. And this, this is what you find me in the meantime? Ashraf, my friend, what is the point of having principles if you don't have anyone around to see that you have any? I can't face anyone if I hate myself for what I'm doing. The man's name was Craig Hicks, but he's often referred to as parking dispute. His real name was a man who shot and killed three Americans in their homes, in their heads, execution style, because they were Muslims. Jada. Yusuf. And Razan. A 23-year-old, 21-year-old, and a 19-year-old. Dia and Yusuf were just named newlyweds, and the three were known by their loved ones as brothers, sisters, students, activists, Instagrammers, but above all, Americans. But now their names are too young to have been taken. Their names are rest in peace. Allah, you Ram, will you see Craig and not ask them for their names? He assigned it to them when he assigned each of them a bullet. Name them a threat to his America and in result took their lives. But why? You know, you know why does it have to be this piece? You know, you know why isn't my dream director asking me to be in another movie? Like, like a romantic comedy where a visiting Arab dignitary finds the joys of windsurfing on his first trip to Hawaii and then he falls in love with the surfing instructor or, or, or sci-fi where a, a muscled Arab man fights a horde of aliens because they want to suck our bone because it's like oil on their planet and then there's a showdown in the mosque and okay, it doesn't have to be the mosque. Look, he doesn't even have to be Muslim! But why do I, why do we always have to be the villains I try? With my stand up to present and show Middle Easterners in a positive light, because there are good people everywhere. I mean, there are good people everywhere. And I hope my name is Amal, it means hope. Most days, my name is waitress at my family's Damascus restaurant. My name is Syrian, American, hijabi, unapologetic Muslim woman. You see, whenever I travel, I carry a small box of altoidments with me. Because after a four hour, seven a.m. flight, everyone has bad breath. And so anyone is willing to take a mint from the Muslim on the airplane. And I know that I have been successful when my neighbor turns to me and says, hey, so what's your name? We cannot let people enter our country. We have no idea who they are, what they do, or where they came from. We have no idea what their records are. So Raymond, I guess you're wondering why I asked you to come in. 
Well, it's about graduation day. I, I know you're our best student and we're proud of you. We're going to have Elaine give the valedictorian speech. She's right behind you grade-wise and we feel like she'll do better because people will understand her better. I mean, with your accent, people have a hard time hearing you. You do understand, don't you? My father's mother liked to scare us with stories of La Llorona, the weeping woman who would steal children away. <laughs> My other grandmother would tell us not to be afraid of La Llorona, that if we prayed, the saints would protect us. But um, neither one of my grandmothers told me that um, there's something more powerful than La Llorona, um, power that takes away parents not kids, in the United States. At the age of four, I didn't know where the United States was or why everyone in my hometown referred to it as El Otro Lado, on the other side. What I knew then was El Otro Lado had already taken my father away. Everybody in Southside knew Eddie. Little Eddie, bad little Eddie. He treated everybody with respect and honor. With blackboard classroom attention, he saw injustice hanging out in La Scalia, sunrise till sunset with the bros and sisters. Your handwriting and initials introduced you into the world as Eddie. Today, political rhetoric around immigrants and migrant caravans has turned people into abstract, faceless concepts. This has created a disconnect from people who are now deemed other. And forgetting that there are people behind those concepts has left us unable to work together to build a strong society. According to the Greater Good Research Center at UC Berkeley in August of 2017, if we replace hateful rhetoric with language that is positive and inclusive, we won't just help Latinos. We'll help build a stronger United States. Prose Out of the Fields by Ramon Reza, The Distance Between Us by Reina Grande, Poetry Poem 9 by Jimmy Santiago Vaca, Song One Time, One Night by Los Lobos, and quotes by President Donald J. Trump. A program, Forgotten Voices, because I want to be heard too. A lady dressed in white with the man she loves, standing along the side of the pickup truck. A shot rang out in the night, just when everything seemed right. Another headline written down in America. The guidance counselors at Redwood High School arrived to advise us on what courses to take. Elaine and I are ushered to a big Anglo man. He has our transcripts in front of him. So you two are the top students, right? Well, uh, Elaine, aren't you interested in college? Uh, well, with your grades, you should be. Um, uh, Raymond, um, I know your brothers, and they're doing very well in Woodshop. We'll sign you up for some of the same classes they have. I'm interested in college and want to take college prep courses. Uh, uh, I don't think college would be such a good idea for you. It'll be too hard, and you won't like it. Why don't you just take Woodshop? How many times they beat you, Eddie? How many police clubs are smeared with your blood, switchblade and bolsa, manos de piedra en la línea con sus carnales, to absorb the tired chap beatings from other locotes? Your blood, and he's flooded sidewalks, smeared shovel handles, coated knife blades, blurred your eyes and painted your body in a tribal body of dance to set yourself free to know what's beyond the boundaries you were born into. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. I became the third person in my family to graduate from junior high. Um, while my accomplishment might not have been much, I knew this was just the beginning. But when my father beat me, and his drunken stupor called me a, a pendeja, hija de la chingada, I, I, and he held on to the vision of the future that he had <laughs> given me during his sober moments. Uh, a second thing to celebrate was that our, our green cars had finally arrived. 
finally, we could let go of our fear of being deported and look to the future with hope. Because that's what Bobby taught us. Here in this country, we could be anything. Poppy took a $5,000 loan under his name to help pay for college expenses because his negra was going to make us proud. School is like living in two different worlds. We do our best to learn English as quickly as we can and to lose our native language, including using English versions of our names. I expect the older kids and the family to speak to me in English at home or at school. They don't. We speak only Spanish at home and we're broken English at school. I, I think in Spanish and I want to make the switch. We watch English language television, pero nobody seems interested. Do you think with all of us living there, we try and help each other? You cried to stop it! Quit giving the wind our grief-stricken voices at cemeteries! Quit letting the sun soak up our blood! Quit dropping out of high school! You absorbing the feeling of worthlessness caught in your brown skin and tongue that cannot properly pronounce English words caught like a seed unable to plant itself! They are not our friends, believe me. The United States has become a dumping ground for everyone else's problems. I became the first person in Lake Valley to graduate from college. As for my father, when he was diagnosed with liver cancer, there were times where I had to tell myself that the father I was about to see was not the same father I'd come to live with. There were times where I would think of the other father, not the violent alcoholic one, but the one who taught me to dream big. Not the one that abandoned me in Mexico, but the one who taught me the importance of an education. The one who taught me to dream big. During graduation rehearsals, I, I noticed for many of us Mexican students, we're becoming more aware of our culture and reacting our Englishized names. When the teacher calls out, Raymond Reza, I tell her, Ramon Reza. This catches her by surprise, but she changes it on her sheet. Eddie blew his head off, playing chicken with his brother, but a proof he was a man. Blew his head off. Eddie's gone. Blew his head off. The explosion of the gun was a golden flash of his voice telling us. No more. No more. No more. Before my birthday, I, I find myself at my father's hospital bed as his life support was turned off. held his hand, I, I thought of that question I'd often ask myself. If I had known what life would be like, could I have still followed him to an otro lado? He took his last breath. And I knew the answer was yes. A quiet voice is saying something to me. An angel song about the home of the brave in this land here of the free. One time, one night in America. Today we are going to be talking about decolonizing medicine. 
What I'm going to describe for you today are the direct health consequences this system has for all of us. We're going to be talking about the impact of social stressors and how they've been shown to cause chronic inflammation. So we usually see diseases as diseases of lifestyle. You know, maybe we eat too much fried food, maybe we don't exercise enough, or maybe we have a genetic predisposition. But how are we supposed to move forward in greater health? If we haven't healed the past, you can see the list of doctors I've seen before you. But you can't see the things that they've said to me, or the way that they've treated me. You can't hear them ask me, but why do you want to be sick so bad? Because there's nothing really wrong. It's just all in your head. I had this black woman come into the office who, every time she quacked, she would get this chest pain. All the medical providers were all inclined to be like, oh, let's just give her some cough medicine. And it wasn't until she stopped coughing and I started hearing her say chest pain was when I realized this woman was suffering a heart attack. So, you know, I asked the cardiologist to perform a catheterized days and to treat the woman's heart condition, but the doctor refused. So I said, look, I don't want this woman to become a statistic that black women receive less medical care than everybody else in the world because the medical institution doesn't listen to them. And to that he asked, are you calling me a racist? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am. Documentaries and podcasts with political pundits continue to argue of the most pressing issues on healthcare. Is it the rising cost of medicine? Is it the corrupt insurance companies? Or is it our politicians? However, what is often left out of this dangerous narrative are the patients. A recent study done by the University of Maryland exposes the implicit biases found in medicine, showing that women, people of color, and the LGBTQ community are less likely to be believed by doctors and more likely to suffer. It is clear that the disparities in healthcare are far from universal. America's Bitter Pill, a program interwoven with Are You Calling Me a Racist by Tanasia Kenny, Health and Justice by Ruba Maria, I Don't Want Healthcare Just Anyone Can Have by Jocelyn Chow, I Got Sick and I Got Better by Jenny Allen, What is Poverty by Joe Goodwin Parker, and The Art of Being Normal by Lisa Williamson. Because as a woman of color, healthcare is not just a political issue, it's a humanitarian. Okay, you're waiting for the doctor, right? And waiting can be very irritating. So, you know, you'll wait in the waiting room for like um, an eternity. And then the nurse will come in and she'll be like, oh, the doctor's ready to see you. But the doctor won't come in for another 45 minutes. So you're just sitting there on this paper covered examination table wearing, wearing this giant piece of origami. And, you know, sometimes I'll be myself. I'm kidding. I would never weigh myself. <laughs> you know, I just sit there and wait. It's funny how you could be in a place so beautiful and ridiculous at the same time. I have an appointment with my doctor, and I've been seeing her ever since I was seven, so she knows me pretty well. She asks me, how's it going? And I tell her that in class today, our teacher asked us what we wanted to be when we grew up. And, and I said, a boy. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, the kid who looks back is a stranger. And she asks me if I've been practicing my breathing exercises. No. And she says, I'm disappointed. As a concerned citizen, I must voice my adamant disapproval of universal health care. It's the universal part that irks me. Every time a hospital administrator sees me flash my blue cross card, it says something. It tells the rest of the world, hey, Look at me, I pay increasingly high month premiums. <laughs> but when this bill passes, they'll be handing out insurance cards like Willie. No, my children have no extra books, no extra pens, no paper, no magazines, and most importantly, they don't have health. They have infections, they have diseases, they have pink eye all summer, they do not sleep well on the floor. My $78 keep them from suffering from hunger, but they do suffer from malnutrition. You can see my age. But you can't see what being sick does to someone at this age, the life I've had to postpone. You can see the images of my lungs, but you can't see what my lungs have stopped me from doing. Yeah, I found out I was sick. Gans, obviously, but when I got my pathology report, I 
I went into my room and hid under the covers for 13 hours until my husband Jules. And I said, I'm a doucey Jules. And he goes, oh, okay. Now you know. What's for dinner? What's for dinner? Are you freaking kidding me? Healthcare is all about exclusivity. Pure and simple. After all, how do I know I've made it in the world? If I can't enjoy something, others can't. Lack of access to healthcare is the seventh leading cause of death in this country, and that says something. It doesn't get much more exclusive than being in a club others are literally dying to get into. My children have no extra book. And you say to me, there are health clinics. Yes, there are health clinics, but those are in the towns. I live eight miles from the towns. I can walk that far. But can my children? I have a checkup with my oncologist, and she asks me, how's it going, Jenny? So I give it to her straight. You know, I feel like I was in a violent car accident, except the accident is still happening. You know, I feel like the people who are supposed to protect me didn't. I feel like I wouldn't have gotten ovarian cancer, which would have just been diagnosed soon if the doctors just done some more tests. You should have listened to my pain. I feel like I'm dying and I'll continue to die with no answers. And she says, what do you want me to say? I want you to tell me that I was misdiagnosed, that the doctors were wrong, that I am not dying. I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. I'm sorry I haven't found anyone I can trust. I'm sorry I have no one to talk to when things get confusing or difficult. I'm sorry I've been trapped in a body I recognize less and less every day. I'm sorry I'm not normal, and she says to me. I'm sorry for your inconvenience. Sorry for my inconvenience. But she wasn't sorry. They're never sorry. So we know that Native Americans, Black and Latino people experience disproportionate rates of violence every day. But how does this reality contribute to the health disparities we see? Well, health is impossible when living in systems of oppression. We cannot effectively treat diseases like diabetes with the pill without addressing the systems that make it so prevalent. We must redefine healthcare to include care not only at the bedside of the individual, but dismantle the systems that create the conditions for the illness. We must decolonize because it's the healthcare system as a whole. It's racist, and we're all participants of that said system. A part of it is trying to unlearn our own implicit biases that we've been raised with in this society. Only then can we truly be healthy. Even the poor can dream. Dream of a time when there's money, money for the right kinds of food, for pills, and money to pay for a trip to the town. As I walk into the hall of your office, please try to see past the list of numbers and understand the trust I am putting in. Please try to not see a graph and, and just see me. It was a warm and sunny afternoon that a mother duck was waiting for her final egg to break open. Congratulations, sir. Your daughter is beautiful. But, sir, your baby has Down syndrome. What? 
No, no, no. No, 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 no. Down syndrome. Look, um, I, I, I'm sorry, my, my wife and I, we were expecting a different child, a normal one. He asked if I wanted to hold Sarah, but I shook my head no. But my wife reached out her arms and said, hello, Sarah. Her voice was musical. I wanted to love Sarah and accept Sarah, but I felt more of a connection to my daughter's chromosomes than I did to her sleeping face. My face may be different, but my feelings the same. I laugh and I cry and take pride in my gains. People judge me by standards that man has imparted, but this family I've chosen. Well, help me get started. According to the Washington Post in 2018, the worldwide abortion rate for a fetus diagnosed with Down syndrome is now more than 80%. But I'm not here to talk about abortion. That's a woman's choice. However, if as a society we continue to support Down syndrome as a singular and valid reason for termination, we are indirectly discriminating against this community, further proving that our inability to understand and accept those that are different from us leads to the stigmatization and alienation of those who are just trying to fit in. 99% of people living with Down syndrome reported that they're happy with their lives. So what messages are we sending to our Down syndrome friends, employees, and family members? This is about practicing inclusion promoting equality, and celebrating diversity. Redefining Normal with the poetry, The Down Baby Creep by Sharon O'Jansen, the children's book, The Ugly Duckling by Hans Christian Andersen, the article, You Are Not Normal and That's a Good Thing, and the drama, Beautiful Eyes by Paul Austin and My Life with Luke by Loya Blanson. A program, because in a society so obsessed with perfection, we often forget that we are all more similar than we are different. And then the egg started to break open. Wow. Oh, oh, you are a very ugly duckling. I mean, you don't look like the other pretty little duckling. Oh, what, what if it really is a tea you want to eat? Why? It could really be a turkey. Oh, it could be a turkey. Oh, I'm so glad I made that decision so many years ago. You see, uh, when I was pregnant with my son, Luke, well, the doctors told me there was a 75% chance that he would be born with Down syndrome. Then sure enough, on January 26th, I gave birth to my beautiful baby boy, Luke, with an extra chromosome. Yes, my son, Luke, was born with You are not normal. And the ducks would say all sorts of mean things, like, Oh, I wish your mother could do something to, like, uh, improve you. What kind of a duck child are you anyway? I'm one of the children, so special and few, that came here to learn the same lessons as you. That love is acceptance, it must come from the heart. We all have a purpose, though not the same style. So Luke started working at Panera Bread, and I went to go pick him up. I was a little early, and I saw him uh, near the back, and near the sandwich making table. And he looked at me, threw his hand up, and yelled uh, with perfect pronunciation. Hey, what's up, biatch? Ah, uh, Luke! I make an immediate you turn her right out of that place! Where did Luke learn to talk like that? I mean, did I talk like that? <laughs> well, no, no, of course not! Oh, that must have been his older brother. So now our son Luke talks like a hip-hop gangster wannabe. I don't want to be anywhere near that ugly creature. I wish the cat would just get you. You are not normal when you first meet Luke. Well, he's probably gonna give you a hug. I mean, he'd give you a hug. No, oh, he'd give you a hug. And he... <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Luke hugs everybody. You see, Luke doesn't care about your race, gender, or the color of your fingernails. Luke just loves. Oh, uh, I used to give him these little uh, $2 taxi coupons well, to get to work. But the taxi drivers would never take the coupons. No, they actually used to fight over who would get to drive my Luke. They loved him so much. You know, we've had more good times than we've had bad. And I wouldn't change that decision that I made so many years ago for anything that this world has to offer. Hey, Sarah, happy birthday. It's a big day for you, okay. 
Listen, you need to tell me. You still like Winnie the Pooh, right? Well, actually, Dad, I cried at the Winnie the Pooh movie. What? Sarah, you cried at the Winnie the Pooh movie? Well, they, they were throwing popcorn at me. Remember, Dad? It was a birthday party, and I, I got an invitation. But, but the kids, the kids in, in the theater, they, they were laughing at me. And, and they called me. They, they were calling me a retard. Dad, they were being so mean to me. But I, I hate Winnie the Pooh because he is always having trouble with the little things. And, and if you think about it, Dad, he's actually a really good representation of, of somebody with special needs. Like me. Because, because he tries and he tries and he tries People just laugh at him. Dad, when will I get over Down syndrome? Sir, sir, listen, listen to me. There is nothing for you to get over, okay? Down syndrome doesn't define you. But I'm tired of it. So we all have things about ourselves that we want to change, okay? That we might be angry or unmotivated. But your mom and I, we love Sarah. And we think that you're perfect the way that you are. You are not normal. My face may be different, but my feelings the same. I laugh and I cry and take pride in my gains. Then the ugly duckling went down to the water and he saw his reflection and he realized I was sent here among you to live and embrace and I'll do as you do, but at my own pace. He wasn't an ugly duckling, but he was a beautiful swan for I'm one of the children so special and few that came here to learn the same lessons as you and in that moment one little duckling realized you are not normal. No, that there is no such thing as normal. And that, that is exactly as it should be. To Sarah, love Dad. Happy birthday. The things that make me different are the things that make me, me. We need the poo. except for the fact that I thought love looked so much like relationships in Disney fairy tales are obviously fantasy but these are literally the first relationships that millions of kids are exposed to so what's wrong with the four-year-old seeing a downtrodden young girl getting swept off her feet by a handsome prince and then hearing that same story a hundred more times? Well, it has 
to do with our lessons. These stories have been teaching us things like you should forgive lying and outright abuse as long as love is true. Oh, that's why I thought love looked so much like you. Ask any teenager today and they will tell you that it's considered normal to be engaged in constant relationship with their significant others, to possess the passwords to their email accounts, and to know their minute-by-minute -minute movements via location tracking apps. Popular culture has only served to reinforce the idea that being in a relationship means overstepping certain boundaries. So it's no wonder that 43% of college women report experiencing violent and abusive dating behaviors, including physical, sexual, technological, verbal, and controlling abuse. Society has conditioned us to equate possessiveness and codependence with love. So, through the following pieces, the poem, what Love Looks Like by Rupi Cower, the article, Five Awful Lessons That Disney Teaches You About Relationships, The Pros, I'm an Emotional Creature by Eve Ensler, Personally by Jana O'Neill, and The Woman Who Walked Into Doors by Woody Doyle, we will see that instead of romanticizing toxic relationships, we must acknowledge them for what they truly are. Bad romance. The program. It's a little weird how almost all the relationships in Disney fairy tales are based on some sort of massive deception. For instance, in Cinderella, she uses her fairy godmother to fool her prince into believing that she is royalty. Oh, I'm sure the moral of the story is supposed to be, um, it's what's on the inside that counts. But looking past your partner's terrible actions is exactly what keeps people in toxic relationships. Dear Rihanna, I used to really respect you. I mean, hiding on my hair cut all cute and shaggy shapes. Yeah, um, it looks better on you. Anyways, I don't understand how you could be so mean to Chris. I mean, how could you dump him after one? So my biggest problem had been uh, oh, deciding how to describe myself in three lines or less. Okay, um, 33 years old, who likes gardening, charity work, and um, uh, romance novels. Interested in friendship first. Oh, we'll see if anything develops. I swooned the first time I saw him. Oh, I actually did. He, uh, he asked me to dance. And right then, he had me so, oh, I had to marry him. On our wedding day. Oh, God, I mean, he just had this smile. A smile that said, I love you. That said, we were gonna live happily ever after. And you know, I, I believed him. Until one day, um, he lost his temper. He hit me. Dear Rihanna, I heard Oprah say that if a boy hits you once, you leave them right then. But that's why like so cold. You, you should take Chris back. I mean, Chris made an entire video apologizing to you and then posted it in front of the whole world. My boyfriend didn't even leave me a video. I mean, once um, he bought me a bracelet after she made my lip bleed. Imagine! 
Imagine if your boyfriend romanced you by kidnapping you and locking you in a castle. <laughs> yes, well, that's the cheery story of beauty and the beast. Yes. It also ticks off all the boxes for domestic abuse. So the next day I got a response. His name was Jimmy. Um, he took me out for drinks and well, um, we we end up at his place. He's um, crawling on top of me, making me feel like a piece of meat. And I, I say stop. Please, stop. Instead, he, he slaps me hard. And then he said, thanks for the drinks. Here's some cab fare. So, so I decided maybe my bio wasn't good enough. So I jazzed it up a little bit because maybe I was attracting the wrong types of people. That I changed my age, my religion, my hair color. No one. And the more that I, that I degraded myself by hanging out with these losers, the more desperate that I got. I mean, I, I went to bars that made my skin crawl, that I slept with men who left in the middle of the night, never calling again. They just referred to me as a good piece of meat. asks again. Well, I tell her, that I don't think love is him anymore. Maybe we're looking at it wrong. We think love is Disney relationships, romance novels, happily ever after. Something to look for out there. The something meant to crash into us on our way out of an elevator. No. What does love look like? I think love starts here. Turning inwards and learning to love yourself. 